the subtle human connection are missing. So we actually get this feedback and all this data then is also sitting on our dashboards and I'll be more than happy to share these dashboards with all of you. Uh, every minister has his own dashboards and this enables us to monitor our department's progress real time. So I have close to about uh, 200 tiles and, on a dashboard and each tile is quite deep. So these dashboards and the way we look at our reports has really changed uh, the way we can deliver uh, at the field level. Apart from that, these dashboards are public dashboards. So in some sense, we have democratized uh, data. And the biggest challenge in India is we don't do that. We tend to hold it back. We said, no, let's just open it up. Let people see this. This has created amazing competition with the district manage magistrates, the collectors of various districts. They started competing with each other. So the role of the minister is slowly becoming more of a policy making and facilitation. And uh, the system is going into a mode of being self-driven, which is very rare from that part of the world. So this is something that I believe is going to be very powerful. And visualization of data is going to be very, very uh, critical. The other uh, area that we've also done a lot of work is internal uh, uh, government transformation projects. I'll give you two specific examples to that. Uh, we in the state of Andhra Pradesh have no paper. There is, we don't get physical papers to our offices. Everything comes online. Through e-office, we actually sign our files. My average speed at clearing files is 2 hours and 40 odd minutes. And that makes me the second fastest minister in the state. There is a minister who clears his files in 45 minutes. And I can bet you no other state government will give you this statistic. So we are the only state to actually implement it end to end. And our entire treasury is now powered by SAP. So we brought in CFMS system so we can run analytics, we can actually measure where the money is going, understand it better, link it to outcomes. And this is where I think you know technology can play a very, very important role. This is all great, but I think actually creating a mechanism where citizens can engage is going to be even more critical in the fourth industrial revolution. Because anyone who has a smartphone is a well-informed and a well-engaged citizen. So we as a state have now taken hackathons to a next level. So we've taken use cases from the government and we've created thematic hackathons. So it could be blockchain, fintech, big data, agri-tech, uh, gow-tech. We like to put tech to everything. So we were able to do these hackathons and we were able to identify you know, bright minds. And we are now using this as an opportunity to do procurement in the state. So for the cutting edge technology, uh, you know, trying to write an you know, RFP is exactly, you know, it's not easy and trying to do an e-procurement is even tougher. But we started using hackathons as the mechanism uh, for, pro uh, for procurement at government. I'll give you two examples of this. Um, one is, uh, you know, drinking water tankers. Especially in summer, we have to send water in tankers to remote villages for drinking water. It's a hundred crore. A hundred crore is roughly about a fifteen to eighteen million dollar budget that I, as a minister, have to uh, deliver drinking water for the for three uh, summer months. It's a black box. So on record, the tankers go, the money gets drawn, but then I get negative articles. Every day in the paper saying, you know, there's water crisis, the tankers are not coming, so on and so forth. So we Uberized it. So we Uberized drinking water tankers. And this was, this came uh, from two kids in the state. Very simple project. Start trip, take a picture of the empty tank, take a picture while filling the tank, and then you track where he's going. And while dispensing water, he again takes another picture. So, governments would have to be focusing on two things. One is preventive, one is preventive care and the other is curative care. And looking at this from the uh, from the lens of uh, uh, how to improve this uh, health care, one would have to be talking about availability, accessibility of health care and also affordability of health care. All these three would have to be moving in line. In order to do that, uh, from my state's perspective as to how we have, how, like, how we have been uh, wanting to move forward is, 
we've taken every uh, 2,000 people, uh, every pop population with uh, every village with 2,000 population as a unit, and we're coming up with the village clinics. Okay. And then uh, we're taking up every uh, 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 30,000 population as a unit, as a, a unit, and uh, uh, classifying it as mandal, and where we're coming up with two PHCs, uh, primary health centers. These primary health centers would have uh, 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 four doctors, two of the doctors uh, uh, present in each of the PHC center, and they would be given uh, an ambulance, 104, and each of this doctor would be given their designated villages. So five villages or four villages, depending on the mandal size, to each of these doctors, and these doctors every alternate day would hop onto the ambulance and visit the village and they would become the family doctor for that village. Very soon the doctors, because they've been de designated only those four villages, so they would start to identify people by names and they would use this village clinic as a hub. This village clinic primarily would be having an a and a nursing graduate, a mid-level health practitioner, and ASHA workers that we spoke about also reporting there. So that would take care of the, the preventive part. Now comes the curative part. The curative part would be dealing with uh, uh, the community, with uh, uh, district hospitals, the teaching hospitals, and the area, hosp area hospitals, and the teaching hospitals are going to play a very critical role there. So there we're coming up with uh, uh, every parliament taken as a unit uh, we've, uh, uh, in order to ensure that there is equitable distribution of uh, teaching hospitals. Because only when you have, when you, only when you establish teaching hospitals, you have postgraduate students actually coming up there. And only when you have postgraduate students doing their course there, and these uh, teaching hospitals are connected to a, a hospital, a teaching hospital as well. So teaching college and teaching hospital together would become the tertiary care that, we're, that we are looking for.